So I gave you the first part. So all of you got that. Good work. Um, so the one uh, A read the, read in the raster dem using rasterio or rasterio. Uh, so file name there. Uh, that was pretty simple. Just rasterio dot open. Or you could use you could do you could do it in context as well. So you could use the with statement. Um, so there's the data set there, I'm, and I did it this way so that I could break it up into steps later on. So data set, raster.io.open, file name. Very good. Just like a regular Python file, right? Um, so to get the bounds, data set.bounds, and just like I did before, we've got to convert it into the right configuration for plotting. So here's that part, bounds there. Uh, get the metadata for this raster file, just data set.meta. Pretty simple. And so it um, is only one band, because it's a DEM. Uh, here's the CRS. Here's the transform. Number of pixels in the Y, number of pixels in the X. And no data representation, which is just a super tiny little number. Or a super huge number, actually. Um, hugely negative. So great, wonderful. That's that step. Uh, one D was get the data for this raster file. So that's just data set dot read band. And there's only one band, so we don't need to do that other thing before. So if you tried to read one, two, and three, you probably got an error. Right? Uh, so data is just one band. Uh, so plotting, pretty simple. Import matplotlib, do it in line. Plot the raster. That's all you need to plot. In fact, actually this is all you need. Oh, hold on. I gotta run all these lines of code here. Oh. Oop, oop. Right, one line of code to print the, uh, the map. Okay, so just so everybody knows, this is a DEM of the New York um, area. Like most of the data, um, and I chose I did it in you know this this C map here to make it pretty, uh, but in in actual fact it's just kind of hard to read. But there you go, it looks good on my screen here. Uh, so that was pretty simple. Okay, um, what was that? Step two, working with raster data. Okay, so did people attempt this? This was a very unscientific analysis of DEM data, by the way, but it was a simple thing to do, so I thought I'd give it a go. Uh, so yes, according to the Department of Environmental Conservation, by 2050, we can expect about 19 to 29 inches sea level rise in the lower Hudson Valley and Long Island regions under a rapid uh, ice melt scenario. And I provided my source there. Um, so create a new grid. That, and set all of the cells that are less than 29 inches, I'm assuming the worst, um, to zero. And according to Google Translate, 29 inches is 0 0.74 meters. Uh, so that which is what the uh, measurements are in here. Uh, maybe you didn't know that, so maybe you used 29 in there. That's OK. Your results will look a little bit different and be wrong. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's OK for the purposes of the exercise, right? Uh, so I just created a, a, uh, a um, matrix called future, and I just copied the data into there so that if I do something to the future, it's not going to, um, it's not just a reference, it's an actual copy. So future, where future is less than uh, uh, 0.74 meters, and I set it to zero. Okay, so then what is the percentage of cells above sea level uh, that may be impacted? So not at sea level, but above sea level. So we need this part here. Less than 0 0.74 divided by the total size of the raster, total number of cells, times 104%. Actually, not that much. So we won't, I mean, there's no point worrying about it, right? It's only 4%. Uh, then, so that's my very unscientific analysis of sea level rise in New York. No, it's nothing to worry about. Um, 
And then uh, part 3C was to compute a histogram. This is something you do a lot in, you know, if you're working with rasters in GIS or something like that. Um, and it's very easy to do. You just uh, use you know, plot.hist from uh, matplotlib. And we have to flatten the data so that we get all of the cells as one array. Otherwise, you get a, hi a histogram for every column, I think, in the array, which is no good. And so plot.grid. Plot that show regular old histogram, and you know you can play around with the um, uh, the binning and things like that uh, based on your knowledge of um, the uh, raster data and that sort of thing. But that's just the default one. Pretty good. Um, and uh, I just print here's just so you can you know you can print statistics. This wasn't part of the thing. I just did this so you can see you could print various different statistics about the DEM, um, you know, as part of your analysis or summaries and things like that. So I just created a flat version of it, and then you know you can calculate the mean, the min, the max, all this stuff using just regular old NumPy stuff. So no, you know, it's just you're just working on a regular old array. You can do all the stuff that you can do with an array, but it's actually DEM data in this case. Uh, and then the bonus: how many people did the bonus round? Some people actually did. Wow, okay. Did it work? Did you get it? Sort of. Sort of. Good. Here's mine, which I, you know, like, I changed some colors and played around with a little bit on the plane on the way here. Um, and so, yeah, I just calculated contours. And it's very simple, right? So to just show the image, we just do plot.im show, right? Same as before. To add contours, which is something kind of cool that people do quite often when they're looking at DEMs, just plot.contour. You can just use regular old matplotlib stuff. No extra special geospatial stuff here. Because this, the geospatial coordinates, we can just specify in our extent here. So plot.contour on the data, extent, a uh, few things here. And then I specified some specific levels, just um, so a zero. 0.6 for some reason and one meter all the way up to 100. Plotted those. And then I, this is just a little thing where I grabbed the first three contours and changed them to red to show danger zones. So just some mucking about. It's not, not important. But the cool thing here is, you know, we can just use regular old NumPy matplotlib commands to do stuff on raster data. So we, we kind of get that stuff for free just because we're using NumPy arrays as our... Um, as our data format, right? So by sticking with Python conventions, we get all sorts of stuff essentially for free, which is cool. So you do, there's no learning new things, basically. Um, so that's kind of fun, right? And as you can see, the coordinates on the axes are in uh, uh, lat-long coordinates, so they're in there, it's in the right place, and so on and so forth. OK, good. That was kind of a harder one. The next couple exercises are easier and more fun. Okay, so I'm gonna, we gotta go fast, or faster. Um, but this is, the, this is really cool, this stuff, okay? So, not that the other stuff wasn't cool. Okay, so databases. We've talked about different file formats and how to read those, um, but uh, you know that's not always what we want. Sometimes we need to access our you know, um, our corporate database, or we need, you know, concurrent access, or, what, what, you know, data integrity of some kind, whatever. Some reason we need to access databases. So how many people have used, or how many people have used PostGIS? Okay, how many people have heard of PostGIS? Okay, not actually that many more. Okay, well, I'll talk a little bit about PostGIS, but... Um, this isn't a course on PostGIS, this is a course on Python Geospatial, so I'll have to gloss over some stuff. So PostGIS is, um, it adds basically a, it spatializes a PostGreSQL, I don't know how you're supposed to say that, um, database, so it gives it uh, the power of GIS, you can do geospatial queries, you can store geospatial data, um, all sorts of cool stuff like that, okay? So basically, it adds support for geographic or geometry objects in a regular SQL database, okay? And it 
gives you functions for querying and manipulating geospatial data using SQL. Um, you can access a post-GIS database from pretty much any GIS. Most of them support it. And now you can in Python as well. Or as because of that, you can in Python as well. Um, and the cool thing is you can, you can keep spatial and aspatial attributes and things all in the same database. And you can do joins and spatial joins and all sorts of regular SQL joins with the spatial data. So that's pretty cool. Uh, sometimes we do still want a file, but we want a file-based database, right? So something that I can store all sorts of different, you know, layers or something like that. I can uh, query them using SQL, but then I can still put it on a USB drive and give it to you for a tutorial, which is exactly what I did. Um, so uh, you may have heard of spatial light, perhaps, um, or SQLite. I'm sure everybody's heard of SQLite, right? Um, all of your phones have it on there, so um, you didn't know that. There you go. Uh, but you can put geometry in an SQLite database because... Remember from before, we have a well-known binary representation of points, lines, and polygons. Everybody remembers that, right? Uh, so you can just store that well-known binary representation in an SQL database. Blammo, you've got a database that stores geospatial data. Granted, a regular plain old SQL database does not, or a SQLite or SQLite database doesn't know necessarily what to do with that geospatial data but it can store it, and maybe Python does know what to do with it. Uh, there's also this new thing called GeoPackage, which is an OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium. We already heard about them. Standard for storing simple features, geometries, as well as uh, like map tiles. So it's a format where you can store all that stuff together. So the idea is you can store like everything you need for a web map, including all the layers and stuff in one database. And it is pretty much just a like, souped-up SQLite database. So it's lightweight. You can do all sorts of geospatial queries. It's very cool. And it uses the uh, well-known binary representation for data as well. So it does uh, uh, post-GIS, by the way, for the most part. Right, so these are lightweight, fully functional databases. Um, you can store and transfer vector data and with, in the case of GeoPackage, image tiles as well. And this GeoPackage, it's, you know, it's starting to be used by a lot of people. With the, you know, everybody wants to make web maps, so it's becoming a pretty popular um, format. It's just, the specification was just pretty recently released. Um, and so uh, some of the guys who are working on it, or folks who are working on it, have been going around to conferences like this talking about it. So, anyway... Uh, it's pretty small text here, but you know, a regular database uses SQL or SQL. Uh, select admin name, G, I can't remember, GMI admin, pop admin from bounds.uk. Right, simple statement, and we get back some tabular data like that. Right? So a spatial database uses SQL. Same exact thing, except this time I asked for geom as well. Geom, you can imagine, probably stores something like geometry. And what I get back there is the same tabular data with geom, geometry, stored as well-known binary, which to you and me makes no sense at all. It doesn't look, it doesn't look like anything we would recognize as uh, shapes, but in fact, these are actually polygon boundaries for England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, or at least part of the representation in binary format. Okay, so that's pretty handy, but we need to be able to do something with that. Um, in addition to just being able to get geometries out of the database, we can also do queries that are, that are specific to geospatial data. Okay? So I can do something like select... Okay, and I've got, uh, I've got two different layers here, okay? I've got a roads layer, and I've got a municipality layer. And the roads is R, municipalities are M. So M dot name, get the length, basically this query gets the length, the total length of roads in each municipality in BC, which is my hometown. Um, and yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. Okay, so it's like an um, a intersection. Okay, and then we um, summarize by each municipality. 
So we get a simple output like this. So we did all sorts of geospatial queries, and the output is uh, different municipalities, Surrey, Vancouver, Langley, Burnaby, Prince George. There's a bunch more. Um, and the total length of roads in each of them. Okay, right? And so we never even you know, had to touch data or anything like that. We just did all that right in SQL. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to show you not so much how to do that using PostGIS, but how we can do similar kinds of queries in Python. Okay. Um, okay, so how do we do this in Python, right? Uh, well, connecting to databases in Python is already pretty straightforward. How many people have done that? Great. Yeah. So pretty much any of the databases that you would care to interact with so, you know, are any of the tools that, in Python that interact with those databases probably support the Python database API specification, which is PEP, I don't know, 0249. Uh, so, which means that you can query these databases pretty much the same as you, uh, you know, the code in Python is pretty much the same regardless of what database you're going to query. Which means that, A, your code is quite portable, and B, again, you don't have to learn a bunch of new stuff to work with geospatial data, because these geospatial databases treat the geometries just like another column, pretty much, in the database. So that means that there's lots of ways for us to connect with spatial databases in Python. So here's one. Okay, I have this database on this machine. You, I didn't require you to install PostGIS because we don't really need it for the examples. So you may not actually be able to follow this one along. And in fact, I don't think I put it in the notebook. Okay, but here, import PsychoPG as database. So PsychoPG is one um, uh, Python library for interacting with databases. This is the one that most people use for PostGIS, um, although you don't have to. But this one knows, what, you know, it, it, it's good for PostGIS. It knows what PostGIS can do, et cetera, et cetera. And it's pretty simple to specify a connection to the database, right? Database.connect, the host, local host in this case. I called it SciPyGIS, and I'm that's me, C Farmer. So I'm connecting to the database. Now, if this is like uh, just regular old Python um, database API type stuff, so I specify a cursor, I specify some SQL. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, this is a, a post just function here, okay? Select st as text, that's just basically going to convert the geometry to well known text as text. ST, I don't know what ST stands for, spatial trick. Uh, ST as text. Spatial temporal. It was originally oh, okay. general, but it's only spatial. Okay, so that's, yeah, spatial temporal. It's just what Post just, uh, you know, prefaces all of their functions with. So as text, converting to well-known text, as well-known text, get the name, get the address, and get the type from a database called, or from a table called Wi-Fi. And just so you know, this is all of the Wi-Fi hotspots in New York City. And it, separate type is whether it's free or you have to pay for it. So that's handy next time you go to, to New York. Uh, so there's the SQL, right? So we just cursor.execute, execute that SQL, we submit that query, and then the results, we go cursor.fetch all. You get all the results back, you, you close the connection, or sorry, you commit the connection, then you close it. And now what you have, this results object, is just like a list of your results. Yes? So is PsychoPG something that can only be used with Postgres and Postgres-like databases? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, unless someone knows otherwise, but I'm pretty sure that's cool. There are other database uh, packages with the same API. Uh, in fact, I'm going to show you another example using a different database package, but with pretty much the same API in a second. Uh, anyway, so we have that results. So I'm just going to grab the first three, and for each of those, I'm going to print, you know, each column separated by a semicolon. Right? So we have point. That's the well-known text representation of that geometry. Uh, the, uh, what is this? The name, text space, the address, and whether it's free or fee. And in, case, in this case, all the first five are all free. Or the first four, five. Um, so there you go. That's how you do it in regular old Python, right? Um, if you use pandas, it's way simpler, right? 
So import pandas as pd, same SQL statement as before. I'm just writing here again uh, for clarity. And then you could use SQ, SQ alchemy, which is what they, uh, the examples on the uh, pandas website use. All right, and so in this case, PostGIS is just a PostgreSQL database that has some extra stuff. So we can just specify it that way, user, at, local machine, and the um, table, or a database name. Or you can use PsychoPG again, connection here, same as before. All right, so pick one of those. Obviously, you don't do both. Um, and then get results and show them. You know, your data frame equals panda dot read SQL. You give the SQL, you give the connection. You look, uh, data frame dot head, bam, you got it. No looping through, no submitting these things, because pandas is doing all that in the background. Isn't that nice, right? And so now we've got a data frame, well-known text, name, address, type, and now we can do all the cool stuff that pandas does with that. Okay, so far, nothing geospatial, except we are doing some geospatial queries in the database. Okay, but that's not what we're here for. We're here for uh, geospatial stuff in Python. So, speaking of pandas, right, um, we are now kind of at this part of the uh, tutorial. We've talked about all the location stuff. Now we're at the spatial isn't so spatial. Maybe it's just another data type that we're going to chuck into a database. And a few data type specific tools, just like you can do specific things with strings, floats, and integers, right? So geometries, why do they have to be so special? Maybe they aren't. Um, so for the data part, we're talking about Python. Okay? Um, I'm assuming most of you already know what Python is. Again, modified BSD license, which is great. Um, pretty much everybody uses it now. Right? So that's good. So what about geospatial data? Right? Well, we have something called GeoPandas which is Python tools for geographic data. Uh, so basically, GeoPandas is, is to pandas what PostGIS is to PostgreSQL, right? Spatializes um, pandas, okay? So we have support for geographic data in pandas objects. Uh, we can treat geometries, and we can do all the things that Shapely can do with geometries, which is like everything you could possibly want to do. Um, there's file and database I.O. functions for geospatial specific formats, which means that anything that Pandas can do with files and databases, you can pretty much do with geospatial files and databases. And it's also a modified BSD license, which means you can do anything you want with it. I saw this picture because it's hilarious. Okay? The goals of GeoPandas, if you really want to know the goals of GeoPandas, you should go to Kelsey's talk on Tuesday. I assume he'll talk about it there. Yes. Uh, also, you should definitely, definitely get involved in the Jewish Pandas sprints, sprint at the end. Okay, it's going to be awesome. Okay. Uh, but the whole point really is make working with geospatial data in Python easy. Right? No, you know, let's not worry about trying to figure out, uh, you know, looping through all these things, different file formats, how to in interact with them. Let's make it easy, right? Just as easy as Pandas does for most other forms of data. So though, really what we're trying to do is make working with geospatial data like working with any type of data in Pandas, right? Why does it have to be more difficult? It's, it's bad enough we've got to try and install all of these libraries. Might as well try to uh, make using them a bit easier. So yeah, I don't, I'm not going to talk about this. I don't know what the philosophy of GeoPandas is. Um, my philosophy is geospatial data is kind of special, but not really. We should be able to treat it pretty much like another type of another data type. Um, so we need a few specific functionality to leverage geospatial data, just like you do for floats, ints, and strings and things. Um, but primarily, we just want to make pandas spatially aware, right? So GeoPandas builds on these things. Pandas, obviously. Shapely, very important for geo geometry operations. Fiona for working with vector data. Uh, and that's actually all we work with at this stage. Um, PyProj for doing coordinate transformations. Matplotlib for plotting. And a few other things when you want to get a little bit more um, uh, fancy with what you want to do. Okay? So as you can see, all of the packages I've been talking about before are get sort of cooked into GeoPandas to make it useful. Uh, and so we have different 
the kind of the most important things in GeoPandas are GeoSeries, which are just a series of geometries, basically, and a GeoData frame, which is geometries and attributes. It's pretty much just a pandas data frame with geometries. Um, and it does all sorts of cool stuff. Pretty much like pandas does. Oop. Okay. So, how do we do this in Python? Right? Uh, okay, so a geo series, pretty simple. We're going to start by from shapely.geometry import polygons, and I'm just going to make a couple basic polygons, simple polygons, okay? Again, pretty much just like simple feature specification. So P1, P2, P3, three polygons. A geo series is literally just a series or a list or array, whatever you want to call it, of geometry. So geo series class brackets, list of, po of uh, polygons, okay? And then if I just print S, or I just uh, write S, then this, this prints out. And what it prints out is the simple features, um, well-known text for each of those geometries, right? Which is kind of handy, um, and it kind of just does that. That's the print... Um, uh, the, the sort of default print for shapely objects, or shapely objects. Um, so that's pretty cool. And there's all sorts of useful attributes and methods that we have on a geo series. So uh, some geographic operations just return a pandas object, because that's what we want, right? Uh, so for instance, if I go s.area, it just returns a regular pandas series of the area of each geometry in my pandas geo series. Right, because that's what I would want. I would just want a pandas series with numbers, <coughs> with numbers in it. These are just floats, right? So that's pretty cool, and you know, no special math involved. Just s dot area. It's an attribute, so it's just stored there, and we can uh, print it. So just like pandas, GeoPandas is very simple for file I/O. Okay. So again, import OS borrow file here. Apparently, I've recently learned that you pretty much don't have to do any of that stuff, and you can just use Unix-style slashes, and it will work. Who knew? Um, anyway, so that's fine. So geodataframe.from file. So it's just like in pandas where you do dataframe.from CSV or from table or from whatever. From file, and just the path to the file. Bam, I got a data frame called borrows. Okay, and then I can do a bunch of regular old panda stuff. Borrows.set index. Let's set the index to borrow code. And I'm going to do that in place so I don't get a new object. I'll sort on the index and print it out. Borrow code is the index. Bam, bam, bam. Here's a few couple extra fields, and there's the geometry field which was created when I read it in. <coughs> and again, it's printing it out as well known text, and it's truncated because it's very long. Right, so it pretty much just looks like a pandas data frame. When I print it out, it looks like pandas with an extra geometry column. <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, here is a simple plotting example. Okay, plotting a simple geo series. Okay, uh, matplotlib dot plot blah blah blah. Uh, here's just creating two subplots. Nothing fancy there, except that I'm specifying that I'm going to share the y-axis just so it looks nice. No big deal. Um, so. S is the series that I created earlier, right? There's three polygons here. S dot plot, and I want to use it in the first axis, so axis equals x1. Bam. Just plotted the geometries. And here, they're weird looking polygons, but whatever, whatever, right? And then I'm going to set the title and specify the x limits just to make it look nice. Okay, how about I want to buffer that, that polygon, or those polygons, right? All of them. S dot buffer, 0.4, and then plot it, all in one line, real quick. Bam, 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 buffered polygons, right there. Uh, set the title, set the limits, show it. It's very simple. In fact, most of this could really be represented in like four lines of code, probably. Okay? <coughs> Plotting something a bit more complicated, a geodata frame, right? Uh, so I already read in this geodata frame, it's called Boros, okay? Make a figure. Boros.plot is just going to plot the, the, the boros. Done. Uh, and then, why not on top of that, I'll also plot the convex hull of each boro, just for 
shits and giggles, right? So borrows.geometry, and that's going to grab whatever column happened to be the geometry column when it was created. Okay, so right, oh, um, if you read in a shape file, it creates it automatically creates a column called geometry, um, but it could have you could have a column called blamo, and if that's the geometry column, then when you do borrows.geometry, it will grab that column, and then you calculate the convex hull of each of those, and then you plot it, and the convex hull is actually just an attribute of the geo series, so that's pretty cool, and then you just show the plot, very simple. And really quick, right? So, um, in fact, recently, oh shoot, what have I done? I've lost everything. How do I demagnify things? Here we go. Excellent, okay. Uh, recently on Twitter, there was a competition between R and Python to see who could plot, read in and plot things the fastest and the fewer lines, t characters of code, and we won. Okay, using this, and uh, I think I have the Twitter. Here it is. Geopandas.read file, here's the file, dot plot. But actually, you can get it right down to that if you import things in a clever way which maybe is cheating but read file foo.shape.plot bam just read in a shape file and made a plot of it and you can save that as you know as a png and chuck that into a publication pretty quick not the prettiest of plots perhaps but not bad okay so that's kind of an aside right geopandas is great and awesome back to databases though okay we can also grab data from databases using GeoPandas, including geospatial databases such as PostGIS. So in this case, uh, PostGIS, you, can, you know, whatever, stores things as a well-known binary. And GeoPandas automatically converts that well-known binary into shapely geometries. So SQL statement, pretty much the same as before, except now I'm just grabbing geom. I'm not converting it to well-known text just grabbing geom straight up as well-known binary. Uh, connection to the database, same as before, geopandas.readpostgis. And then, so it's exactly the same API as pandas, except it's postgis instead of read.sql. And dataframe.head, we print it out, and lo and behold, it looks exactly like what we did before when we read it and did have the well-known text call here. And that just that's just because shapely geometries print out as well-known text when you print them. Okay? So that was easy, right? One line of code, well, I guess three, really. Uh, and we've grabbed data from PostGIS database. Um, so that's pretty cool, but what if we've got some data stored in a regular database or perhaps a CSV file, and we want to make it a GeoPandas data frame, <coughs> or a Geo data frame, right? So last example, as I said, looked a lot like the one before because of the well-known text printing thing. What if we wanted to take an existing pandas data frame, make it spatially aware? Uh, well, the re really cool thing is when you import geopandas, you uh, monkey patch on basically a set geometry method to pandas data frames. So you can take any pandas data frame, call set geometry, and tell it which column is the geometry column, and blammo, you now have a geopandas data frame. Right? How many other languages can do that? Uh, so that's pretty cool. So here is an example. This is an SQL query, which kind of simulates a table or a CSV file that had perhaps X and Y coordinates stored as different columns. So here I just do select ST underscore X geom as X, ST underscore geom as Y. We get X, Y, name, address, type from, from this Wi-Fi database. Okay? If, by the way, there, there's a shape, a Wi-Fi... Oh, no, there's a Wi-Fi SQLite database in your data file, which you can play with later. Okay, so if I use regular pandas uh, read.sql, give it the SQL, give it the connection, print it, here's what I have. X, Y, name, address, type. Okay. So pretend that, you know, that could have been a CSV file or whatever.
Okay? So to make a geometry column, it's pretty easy. Just use a few kind of uh, uh, pandas conventions to do it. So I'm going to create a geometry array or a geometry series, which takes the pandas data frame x and y columns and applies this lambda function to it. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just applying the um, uh, shapely point call to each set of x and y coordinates in the uh, data frame. Okay. I can talk about, again, see we're using unpacking here. Star guy here, and we're going along the ax the this axis. It's nothing too fancy. It's a little bit of um, pandas magic stuff. Um, but anyway, what we have now is a, an array of geometries. Then I just say, okay, let's create a new column called geom, and we're going to set it equal to geometries. So I've just added a new column to that data frame called geom. Okay. And then, uh, just so you know, I'll print it, and it's, it's just it's a regular pandas data frame, right? Nothing special. It just happens to have a column, which is geometries, okay? So I can just coerce it to a geodata frame by using this set geometry call, or set, set geometry method. So I say, okay, the geometry column is the, the geom column is the one that's the geometry column. And just so you know, the coordinate reference system is in EPSG 2263. That, you don't need to specify that, but later on when you do stuff with it, yes? Because I know that in PostGIS, there's differences between naming the, the, the coordinate reference system for the column and actually making sure, like, does this actually check that that is, or can I? No. So what this does is, as far as the geometries are concerned, uh, we don't care. It's, they're shapely objects and shapely geometries have no knowledge of what coordinate reference system they're in. They're just a geometry. It's assumed that they're on some sort of simple Cartesian plane, but not really. Just coordinates and geometries. Pure geometry, no reference systems whatsoever. And then we say, okay, th here's the geometries, and by the way, they're all in this CRS. And that's stored at the data frame level, not at the individual geometry level. So the geometries themselves have no idea. So if I call dfgeo.geometries, well, actually, the CRS will get passed through to this geo series. But it's like the geometries themselves, they have no knowledge of coordinate systems. Okay. Only you do, and the geo data frame does. Yeah, so you can't have multiple geometry columns with different CRSs. Yeah, right. Different. You can't. And you know, arguably, you probably shouldn't anyway. Um, yeah, so this kind of applies to the whole, like there's only one CRS attribute for per data frame. So if you have multiple geometry columns, which you could have, they should all be in the same CRS. Uh, okay, I print out the type, and it's now a geodata frame, which is pretty cool, right? So really, you know, do all your normal panda stuff, and then one extra line makes it a geopandas data frame. And now you have all the plotting functions and geometry calls and things that you get from GeoPandas. So here's the idea. Now we can do all sorts of cool stuff, like working back with the Boros um, polygon shape file, boros.area.sum, the total area of the city of New York in square feet, possibly. Whatever that, uh, yeah, square feet. Not really a useful measure, I suppose, of the area of the city, but there you go. Um, Here's a cool thing. So you've got some, we've got data here in um, uh, State Plain, New York. All right. Say I want to convert from New York State Plain to longitude and latitude, WGS84. Right. I want to convert all those um, points. Yeah, points to the to uh, lats and long. So data frame WGS84. Sure, why not? Is equal to data frame geo two CRS. And I just specify the EPSG code that I want. 4326 happens to be the EPSG code for WGS84. Blam! Well, I have pre reprojected all of the coordinates in that uh, GeoPandas object, and I now have uh, the coordinates in WGS84. And it's actually pretty fast, right? It's going through this. There's like, I don't know how many thousand 
um, points, and it's gone through and done that reasonably quickly. Uh, you can run it on your machine. It's not too bad. And so if I print the data frame geo.crs, okay, it's EPSG2263. <coughs> if I print the WGS84 one, it is now 4326 with this extra parameter and no deaths equals to true. Not important. Yes? Yeah, it works by po polygon by, yes, yes, it does, yeah. Any, any, uh, anything, yeah. Because ultimately it's reprojecting at the point level. Uh, and yeah, points, or, you know, polygons are just a bunch of points, pretty much. So yeah, so you can do it with anything. Points are an easier example to do, so that's why. Uh, and, and so, and there's all sorts of, you know, explore what you can do with GeoPandas. There's all sorts of other functions, like plotting functions and uh, stuff you can, you can do with geometries, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, anything that you can do in Pandas, which is lots of stuff as well. Uh, so you can do really cool stuff like group buys, where you merge the geometries in particular groups and things like that. It requires a little bit of finicking. It's not quite s simple yet, but... It will be. Um, so that's really cool, because then you can do all sorts of very powerful, powerful summaries and things like that um, with a very, very few calls in Python. So as usual, plotting example. Now this is really cool. I hope you guys like this. OK? So here's a super simple map which just plots free and fee-based Wi-Fi hotspots <laughs> in New York City. OK? This part's not the cool part. Um, so dfwgs84.plot, technically that's all that's needed. Now we'll just make, I'll make a plot. Uh, but we're still working on the plotting functions in um, GeoPandas. So uh, here's a, a little bit of code to like, make the points bigger and change the color and things like that. So th this, this isn't important. This is just some matplotlib stuff. Don't worry about it. Really, all we need is that first line. And it makes the plot. And I turn the axes off and things like that just for fun. Okay. So very simple, really it's just one line, make a plot, okay? Now, say I want to make a web map, or a slippy map, you know, as we often call them, um, of that plot, of this exact plot here, right? Just import matplotlib leaflet, okay? And then matplotlib leaflet.display, give it the figure that you want to display, and tell it what coordinate reference system the data is in, and bam, you've got a slippy map. And it's not just a static map, it is in fact a map which you can zoom on, and all sorts of stuff. And it embeds it right in your IPython notebook. So this will impress your, this will impress your friends, right? And uh, maybe in future versions, you will be able to click on the points and it'll bring up their attributes and things like that. But for now, no. But you've got an interactive web map sitting right in your IPython notebook. Uh, converting to slides doesn't work so hot, so this isn't exactly how it will show up. It should have showed up with like a out thing there. But anyway, that's what it looks like. And that was two lines of code. Import matplotlib or MPL leaflet, MPL leaflet dot display, and you have a web map. Done. And where did the base line come from? The internet. Oh, so okay, so it's, it's just open street. It's just open street map base maps, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So there's, so obviously you have to be online for this to work properly, uh, unless you implement some sort of offline caching or something. Okay, perhaps, right? I've done a bunch of analysis, done some cool queries in in pandas, done some reorganization, added some fields, and then I want to make a slippy map and share it with my colleagues, and I've you know, I've stylized it, et cetera, et cetera. So I just didn't display it to show it in the um, IPython notebook. But matplotlib, uh, matplotleaflet.show actually creates a standalone HTML file, which you can then just grab and chuck on a server somewhere, and you've got a web map that you can share with the whole world, for the whole world to see. Right? So you can just chuck it on your web page. You can take the HTML, embed it on a your blog somewhere or whatever you want, right? And so that looks something like uh, this one. This one I did earlier, right? So it's just just a web page, 
it's saved on my computer somewhere, and it's a full page web page, so you can just take that HTML and embed it wherever you want. In fact, this um, is actually just an iframe which is showing that map. So you could just do that on any website. You could just insert the iframe and your map will show there. Um, so the other cool thing is perhaps you know, you're working with a team or you want to do a little bit of GUI editing with the data or whatever. Um, you're working with a team, say, and you want to share it. Well, you can use, anybody ever use geojson.io? Really? Okay, well, it's fine. Now you will. Um, so what you can do is, uh, basically, geojson.io uh, is a website where, well, here, I'll show you. This is what it's all about, right? Uh, geojson.io, right here. Um, oh, I guess I logged out. Anyway, it's a little uh, sort of web type <coughs> interface where you can interact with a map, and you can put data here, and you can add, you know, you can digitize, saves the JSON, you can add columns to the data, and you can share it with your team or whatever. And then you can save things directly to a gist on GitHub or to a GitHub repo. And you can actually interact with uh, JSON, GeoJSON directly from a GitHub repo. So you can actually have a centralized GitHub site which you share between people and you edit it, you load it into uh, uh, Geo, as a GeoPandas array, you do some stuff, you fire it back off to GeoJSON.io, whatever you want. Very cool. Uh, so, I recently used this to interact with the team and it worked quite well. Um, so, to do that, import geojson.io, geojson.display, and here is something also kind of cool. So, boros is the boros shapefile that I had, that I read in as a GeoPandas data frame. I convert it to WGS84 on the fly and then I uh, output it as JSON. <coughs> As JSON as a JSON string. In in fact, because it's a geo object, it's GeoJSON. So what I've done is reprojected on the fly, converted to GeoJSON, and fired it off to the internet for my colleagues to interact with, all in one line. So what I could actually do is I could actually query a database. I could reproject the data, do some sort of geometry buffer or whatever, export to JSON, and fire it off to the internet in one line of Python code which makes you very productive. And it impresses people who use other languages require more lines of code. Um, so here, if I just print out the result from that, it prints the um, link to geojson.io and the gist uh, unique ID. And it just saves it as an anonymous gist, which you can go and check out. And uh, so yeah, don't forget to pop on over to geojson and play around, edit with your layer. I'm not going to do that right now because I didn't run the code here. But here, this is actually not, oh, you know what? I, because I did it a couple hours ago, I bet the gist, it's an anonymous gist, so they probably deleted it. Yep. Anyway, um, this is what it would, it would, would be sitting right here on um, uh, GitHub, and you could interact with it and see it. So that's pretty cool. Again, I just embedded this as an iframe. Uh, but this is, did everybody know that GeoJSON files display like on a map in GitHub? It's pretty cool, actually. And very handy. And actually, if you've made like diffs, if you've changed it, then it actually represents it as diffs. So you can see the parts of the geometries that have changed. It's, it's pretty cool. So you can use GeoJSON.io to work on stuff, fire it off there, then you can look at the diffs and see how your changes work. So there you go. Uh, and I, that last part, I went pretty fast, but it, I just get so excited about it. Um, so apologies for that. So we have one more exercise. So either I leave the exercise for you to do on your own and I try to get some QGIS stuff done, or I let you work on the exercises now and help you tr troubleshoot it and we leave the QGIS stuff and I'll just give you the notes. So uh, we'll do a vote. Hands up if you want to do QGIS really quickly right now. Oh, this is going to be hard. 
Uh, and then hands up if you want to do the working with vectors and Python stuff right now. Okay, well, Q just obviously wins. So I'll leave this as an exercise to the, to you. Um, and we will do some QGIS stuff. So, um, I have been working on the QGIS project since about 2007, which is just around the time that they started using Python bindings for everything. So I waited until that happened, and then I started working with it. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about what QGIS is. I'm probably going to blast through that really quickly. And then mostly I'll talk about what PyQGIS is and how to how Python can interact with QGIS. And for those of you who don't know, QGIS is an open source free desktop GIS. Okay? Uh, and so, anyway. So, officially born in 2002. The guy who started it, Gary Sherman, lives in Alaska. He likes to use Linux. Obviously, the prevailing desktop GIS um, at the time was ArcGIS, which doesn't which is expensive and doesn't run on Linux or, or anything but Windows. Uh, he needed something to look at data pretty quickly, and he wanted to be able to work with all sorts of different data types that all of his clients had in their databases and things like that. So he made it, released it as open source, and now it's probably one of the more popular open source GIS, desktop GISs. Although now it's just called QGIS, not Quantum GIS. Uh, so, user-friendly open source GIS, runs on any platform you can compile it on. Uh, it's an official project of OSGEO, which is the group I've been talking about a little bit. Uh, and pretty much any geospatial data format that you can think of, it supports it. In, it's in that format, right? So, there's no native format for QGIS. If you have a shapefile, it'll open a shapefile and interact with a shapefile. If you've got a grass data set, then it'll work with the grass data set. It has no internal data format. Uh, so that's kind of what it looks like. Um, it's just an all-purpose GIS. Okay? You can do all sorts of things. You can make maps. You can interact with data, zoom in, zoom out, reproject, all sorts of stuff. You can also in, like, uh, connect it to a GPS unit in real time. You can consume web map services and web feature services, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Anything that a good GIS does. Uh, so it's a go-to point for working with spatial data on the desktop if you aren't using uh, Esri products or something. It's also very extensible, uh, primarily through Python. That's its main uh, binding and the main uh, way to interact with it, or with the outside. Um, I've done some stuff with R inside of QGIS. Grass works inside of QGIS. Uh, all sorts of different databases do, but P Python is usually the glue that binds most of these things together. Uh, it isn't expensive. It's very lightweight compared to most GIS. Um, it's not really designed for like full-blown hardcore GIS analysis. Usually it relies on things like Grass or R or Python to do a lot of the more complicated things. Um, but it is not just a free version of ArcGIS. It's its own thing. Okay? And that's what it looks like on Mac anyway. So it looks like a regular old GIS. And in this image, that's the... Wi-Fi data sitting on top of a Yahoo hybrid uh, map, base map. Okay, so what's PyQGIS? PyQGIS is pretty much the complete Python API for QGIS. So anything that QGIS can do, you can do from Python, including anything you can do with the GUI, anything you can do in the back end, anything. It's almost a 100% complete Python API. So you can actually open up a Python console in QGIS and manipulate the menus and load data and drop data and do all sorts of stuff that you would normally do by clicking buttons. So almost complete API coverage. Uh, since version 0 0.9, it has had Python support, so very early on. Um, uh, QGIS uses the QT libraries, which is why it starts with Q. QGIS. Um, so you have to use SIP and PyQT uh, to work with it. So if you have done any PyQT GUI programming and things like that, then it will be very familiar working with in Python. Uh, it's pretty much exactly, as I said, full API. So QGIS itself is written in C++. Python bindings and the Python API is almost the same, except there are a few things to make the Python API a little more Pythonic than C++. Um, 
And there are three main ways that you can interact with QGIS from Python. Okay? So there's a Python console inside of QGIS. You can create plugins that are written in Python to interact with QGIS. Or you can actually, because we've got almost full API, you can actually create standalone applications using Python. And it, it, you, could, you could actually create a Python version of QGIS if you want. Uh, so here's what the Python console looks like. It's pretty much just like any other Python console. Um, Python plugins, there's hundreds of them. Uh, there used to be way more, but then they kind of moved to a more stringent system of like evaluating plugins. So it's right now, last night it was 275. Um, so there's lots of them. I have a couple. Here's one of them, FTools. That's the vector menu in QGIS. Shameless self-plug. Um, you can also write Python applications. All right. So this is pretty much all you need to write a Python application in, or to write a QGIS application in Python. Except this one does absolutely nothing. But uh, you just, you know, from QGIS.core import everything. You could also from QGIS.GUI import everything. Uh, you know, sys and OS stuff. Uh, specify the prefix path. Where is QGIS installed? Where are the QGIS libraries? Uh, initialize it, and then you know you have some do some stuff. Super awesome code that does QGIS stuff here, and then exit it when you're done. And uh, I'm not going to actually write a Python application right now, but that's what you need to get like an empty note. It doesn't do anything, but you have access to everything that QGIS can do. So core is sort of. Core is like geometries, vectors, reading, I/O stuff. So none of the GUI. None of the GUI, and then the GUI is all separate. So you can actually, if you just want to process data, then you don't need any of the GUI stuff. Then you don't need to import it. And uh, so QGIS has its own geometry representations and things like that that you can work with. Okay, how do we do this in Python? Okay, from the console you can do tons of stuff. So when you open up a Python console, these two lines of code automatically get run. Okay, from QGIS.core import everything and import QGIS.utils, which is a couple useful things that, um, that you might want working on the console. Okay, and that pretty much gives us everything we need to interact with QGIS. And it in includes an iFace, an object called iFace, which is the QGIS interface. Um, and from that, you can access everything. So... Here is some Python code which you could put into the Python console inside of QGIS to grab the first layer in the layer list, print out its name, uh, and then iterate through the, all the features, grab it their geometry. If it's a point, print out its well-known text uh, representation, I think, and then um, print out its attributes and then stop after 10. So I'm actually going to just copy this, and I'll open QGIS so you can see how quick it goes. Uh, let's see. We'll use the Wi-Fi data. Python console, so there you go, Python console right there. Uh, let's open up a text thing so I can paste it in. And I should be able to just run this somehow. Where's the run thing? Run script. Oh, I have to save the file. Right. There we go. Oops. Use the Python console. So I looped through the first 10 features, printed its uh, name, which was, oh, sorry, printed the provider name, which is OGR. It's using OGR to read the data. Uh, and then I print the feature ID. For each feature, print the feature ID, print the point representation. Here it is right here. And then print its attributes. 
And then uh, this prints a specific attribute, which is type, so free. So I just loop through them all and print them. Yeah. Yep, you can do any, anything you can do from the user interface, you can do from there. So the user interface requires you to start editing and then do some edits and then save those edits. So you do the same thing from Python. Start editing, do the edits, save the edits. Yep. So yeah, anything at all that you can do from the, from the GIS you can do in there. The API is very comprehensive. The documentation is quite good, although it's, the Python documentation is pretty much just C++ documentation converted using SIP, so it's not always great. Some things are a little different, but you get used to it uh, once you start playing around with it. So that's pretty cool because you can do tons of stuff from the console. Um, but the really cool thing is, say you do some stuff from the console and it works really well, and you've, you're like, hey, maybe that would be useful for other people, and you want to make a plugin. Uh, so a plugin is basically just like specific bits of code that know how to interact with the user interface, and then when you run it, run some custom Python stuff. Um, and it's really easy to make a QGIS plugin. Uh, so uh, there's this tool called the plugin, uh, uh, building Python plugins, and it's the QGIS plugin builder. And it's, 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 it makes writing Python so easy that you don't even need to know how to write Python to do it. So if I want to make a new plugin, um, and I'm going to call it, I've already got one here called SciPy Test Plugin, okay? Uh, so if I want to make one, I go to Plugins, Plugin Builder, okay? Pop, pops up a little user interface. I'm going to call it SciPy uh, Test, okay? <coughs> uh, that's the class name. The plugin name is going to be Super Plugin. Uh, here's a description. Module name, uh, SciPy test, version number, we'll start there. Uh, we'll say super plugin, Carson Farmer, email address, blah, blah, blah. It, I don't think it checks to make sure that it's well formed email addresses. Maybe it does, though, just in case. Uh, you can also specify a bug tracker and things like that. If you've got things on GitHub or whatever, you can do that. Um, if it's kind of experimental code, you're not sure if it's working, you can flag that plugin as experimental. Hit OK. OK, where do you want to save it? I'm going to save it on the desktop for now. Choose OK. Pops up this. It says, hey, good news. I've made you a plugin. Um, here's where it's saved. Uh, your plugin directory is located here, so what you need to do is you need to customize the plugin, copy it to that directory, open up QGIS, and blammo, you've got a plugin installed and ready to go. Okay, so it gives you a little bit of instructions here, and then these guys advertise their company because they're the ones who made that plugin. So you get to do that. Uh, so, just so you know, I'm not lying, here is our plugin, SciPy Test, and it's just a directory with various files. Okay, um, including this one, which is the main one, SciPy test here. Okay, and if we open it up, it's got all sorts of code that um, basically uh, registers your plugin with QGIS. And the coolest thing about this, I'm, I'm, you're gonna be impressed. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, the coolest thing you need to do, all you need to do, is implement the run method of that one file, and the plugin will just run already. It's already set up. Everything's good to go. Just copy it into the plugins directory, re-implement the run method. It'll do whatever you want, whatever you do in the Python code there. So I have a run method right here, which takes the first layer in the layer list, oh, sorry, the selected layer, um, and it prints the layer's name. Okay, Not exactly groundbreaking stuff, but useful nonetheless. So all I would have to do is I just do this. Oops, make sure you get your indentations right. Okay, save that. My linter says I've mixed spaces and tabs. That's okay, because I'm not actually going to use that one. I've actually done this exact plugin already, and I've copied it into the directory so that just in case it didn't work or something like that. Uh, and good news, it does. 
So here I have it, the Wi-Fi thing. I've got the layer selected. Plugins, SciPy test plugin, plugin, uh, and it opens up this annoying uh, empty dialog. Okay, so that's the like regular basic stub. That's what would happen if you didn't do anything. Okay. Now. Okay, great. Take this, copy it, and delete this one, paste it in. Uh, oh, I forgot to do one thing. I don't want that dialog to pop up, so I'm going to comment out. Uh, now, unfortunately, you've got to restart QGIS for it to register. If you're making like uh, incremental edits to a plugin, you can actually um, register that plugin as a development one, and you can just hit a refresh button and it'll refresh it. But I'm not going to do that for right now. Load some data. Plugins, super plugin, super plugin. An error has occurred. Global name. Oh. Uh, so you got to get your imports right, I guess, too. Uh, Q, T, or uh, Q, message box. I'll try reloading it. Um, oh, yeah, no, it's not going to work. Oh, man, pressure's on, Carson. <laughs> See, this is why maybe GUI stuff is too slow. Bam! There we go. The selected layer name is Wi-Fi. There we go. We just made a Python plugin very quickly. <laughs> so it was very e it's easy to do, right? And I'm five minutes over, I think. So apologies for that. Uh, but hopefully it was worth it. Um, I'm sure I'll see lots of new QGIS plugins. So uh, thanks very much for listening.